All right, welcome to the Aware Project Psychedelic Awareness Salon. I'm Ash Booth. I am the founder of the Aware Project, along with, and uh, along with a, a hardworking team of volunteers, we put on this event for the community here in Los Angeles. Uh, just as a little bit of a background, the Aware Project was um, started at the beginning of this year. We felt like there's a lot of stuff going on in San Francisco, a lot of organized groups, and there's not much going on down here in LA. And obviously there's a big population here that is interested in educating themselves about psychedelics and talking about psychedelics. Um, and so we started this event to educate the community, bring the community together, and to start building something here. So um, we're on our, what is this, August 8th month of salons. Um, we also did a very large um, Bicycle Day event in April to celebrate the, f um, the first LSD trip. So that was fun. We're planning to do another one um, next year in April. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so let's see. The rest, um, the, the mission of the AWARE project is to balance the conversation about psychedelics um, and to encourage people to become psychedelic ambassadors. Um, and what I mean by that is coming out of the kind of psychedelic closet, releasing shame around usage, around uh, mindful use of psychedelics, um, educating ourselves and educating others, sharing our stories. Um, so as we you know, come together here, let's um, share our stories with one another, um, learn, be curious, and as we go back out into the world, encur encouraging curiosity, um, telling people, um, you know, and balancing the conversation about psychedelics because it, it has been very heavily uh, swayed in the other direction. Um, so, uh, yeah, I then um, just in terms of a little bit of safety and ground rules here, because this is such a controversial topic, um, please, please, please do not arrive on any psychedelics or any other substance, do not bring anything, do not talk about selling, buying, or making anything here. This is a public event. We, you know, we need to keep the community safe here, so please don't do that. Um, and, because you don't know if there's undercover cops, you don't know if there's informants, like, we're still living in a prohibition world, so let's just be um, mindful and aware and, um, yeah, so, but we are, you know, it, it is such a blessing that we have the freedom of speech here in this country and that things have gotten a lot better over the last, um, you know, a decade or so and that we can come out and talk about this in, in public. And if any of you were here at our first salon event um, with Kathleen Wirt, she used to hold psychedelics um, um, kind of salon gatherings in her house. Um, about 10 years ago, and that she did for eight years in a row. And at that time, people were very scared about knowing, you know, being um, associated with this. It was a very underground event. It was like just, you know, and so the fact that we can do this publicly now, um, and that there's a lot more conversation going on, there's a lot more research that's going on right now, um, it, it's, it's a really exciting time to be um, paying attention and learning about this kind of stuff. So with that, I would like to introduce um, my dear friend, Rachel, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about um, an upcoming conference that's happening here in Los Angeles um, called the Visionary Convergence. And then she's gonna do a poem or two. Whoa. So, yay. Thank you, I'll be okay. Camera ready. It's still all you guys. How's that? Do you like it? Good yeah, light? Great. Okay, excellent. Yes, <laughs> as long as we got good footage. Who cares about you guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Ashley, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be here on this special night with Richard Grossman. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you do for the community. It's so beautiful and amazing. Um, visionary Convergence is coming up. There's a lot of people right here in this room who are going to be presenters, including Richard Grossman. Tony Moss is here. There's tons of people who will be presenting. It's going to be more than just a conference where it's just lectures. There's art. Tons of Peruvian artists will be there sharing their visionary paintings. There will be music and lots of presentations from people from all over the world. It's happening right here. And we're really lucky to have something like this happening in LA. 
It's September 25th to the 27th. I have these flyers. I mean, I can't really see it. You're like, why is she holding it up? But just <laughs> so you kind of recognize it when you head out. It's over there, or you can come see me, ask me about it. And there's also a very, very fancy pink legal pad. You'll recognize it because it looks like a pink legal pad over there. And then scribbled on top, it says Visionary Convergence email list. So that's what it is. You'll, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's what you talked about. So please, if you want more information, please sign up. Um, uh, you can like us on Facebook at Plant Teachers to find out more about what's going on. And I just really encourage you to take me up on this opportunity to be a part of this amazing happening. Even if the whole like stretch of the three days is more than you want to do, there's independent workshops happening and lots of cool stuff. So. That's my pitch on that. Does, I'm serious. Does anyone have any questions? Because like, I really want you to feel empowered to know how rad this is going to be. Okay. I will say this. If you come to the Plant Teachers page right now, Mitch Schultz, who is the creator of the film DMT, The Spirit Molecule, just did an interview with Sita, who this is all Sita's project, if you're familiar with Sita. This is her brainchild, and she's had a vision to have this happening in our own backyard so that we have something right here in LA. And if you're like, maybe that sounds interesting, but I don't know, I would love to know more about the approach than what Rachel just blathered on about. Right now, they just posted today an interview called The Probe with her and Mitch talking about why she wants this to exist, what's going to be happening there, and more about the thrust of what we, we want to create. So. Just posted that on Facebook, Aware Project Facebook. So you can even and just go to Aware Project that you already like and love and click on all the time. So <laughs> yeah. go there. Subscribe to our events. <laughs> Subscribe to events. And Ashley's mail, mailing list is over there too. And other, you should just sign up on all the email lists over there. <laughs> like, just sign up on them. And there's cool stickers over there. And also, my CD and book will be over there. So if you like what you hear and you want to support independent art, you can like leave tonight. Be like, hey, I supported independent art tonight. I'm awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, so with that, that's enough. Um, your public service announcement is complete. I will now do some poetry for you. So right now, um, I'm a Jew. Shocking, I know. So, you know, I didn't want to blow your minds. I want to ease into that one. So we're ruled by the moon. We follow a lunar calendar instead of a solar calendar. And so the months are a little different. So right now, we just entered the month of Elul. And Elul is my favorite month because the teaching is that the gates are open and that we're closer to the infinite. And so like these are God's office hours, to quote my teacher, David Sachs. So if there's something specific you want, now's the time to ask for it, right? You can't blame anyone but yourself if you didn't declare your desires. Now's the time. So I write prayers for Elul every year. So here's one of my Elul prayers. Let I me, us, we, come awake to this inviolable truth. We can be brand new. I follow in the footsteps of King Solomon. I am for my beloved and my beloved is mine. Hearts intertwined, I am 10,000 brides on a magic carpet ride in flight toward the glory of restoration. Let us be sanctified vessels. This subtle truth is so elusive, it slips like water through my clumsy-hearted fingers. Let us remember we are fashioned from the miraculous. We convene in the star-strewn field of possibility, in glorious communion with you, guided by consecrated constellations, virgin soil beneath our bare feet, night blind and moon drunk, hopeful in our brokenness. We relinquish the dangerous safety of cleverness, rebuild us fearless in our willingness to know we 
know nothing. We can be brand new. Let us be love. Open our fists. Turn our palms skyward to receive. We shake off the label of soldier, disengage from the nonstop onslaught of battles we can't even understand. Love struck, we will fight the good fight, warrior shamans of light in our own right. Bless I, me, us, we, with resilience. Fortify our hearts against the opposition. We teeter on the brink of dazzling emergence. Allow us to free fall into the river of brilliance that flows unendingly from the depths of divinity into Eden, into the garden of matter, into the open field of possibility. Reinstate beatific order from chaos as we listen to King Solomon. Look to the ant, consider her ways, and be wise. Ponder the wondrous waggle dance of the bumblebees, the impossibly synchronous star waltz of fireflies. Reveal our true nature. We are all divine emanations, each of us blessed letters emblazoned in sacred texts made ready we will shine one beautiful moonbeam at a time until the world is bathed in radiant splendor give us the ears to hear the celestial blast give us the eyes to recognize we were made for creating for marvelous coherence oh glorious conductor of the symphony of us the walking wounded healers holding on to one another for dear life, faithful in the knowing that the greater the darkness, the greater the light it precedes. Crack ourselves open. We will cleave to the divinity of Devekut. Make us Mechabel, receiving in order to give is the purpose of creation. Experiencing goodness is what we came for. We are engaged in ecstatic preparation. We can be brand new. We have but one true vocation to expose our indestructible souls. Beloved, I, me, us, we beg you, throw open the windows to our tears. Immerse us in the mikvah of weeping. There is nothing as complete as a broken heart. The more shattered we are, the more whole we can be. We wail, kiss a fragment of wall, dream of rebuilding. Again, no suffering is in vain. Show us the infinite through limitation. Unwrap the gift of our holy homesickness. Allow us to climb into your intimacy. Let us feel the sweet relief of not having to have all of the answers. Let us know, Yira, in the star-strewn field where we meet you before the gates close. Hold us in a slow dance, ecstatic embrace. Fill us with emuna. We can be brand. New.
Uh, oof, we all need it. I will come. Like a flashback, finally slack and unraveling, like intake and breath, like your best guess, like warm air caressing cold flesh. I am resting intentionally in the parentheses of your future tense memory. I will come. Like karma, like deja vu, the dance you've always known the steps to, I am specifically meant to directly address you. And my best fantasy is your smile. I'll come from around the corner of your mind, out of the blue, out of left field, the snack tatter of a dream that seemed real, worth remembering, the other side of the membrane separating everything from everything. I am the whisper from the ghost in the machine. I am the promise from a fickle god you thought forgot you. I am the feast on the laden table, ready, legs buckling. I am the what if, the obsolete pattern, shattered, unspiraled, and unspooling. I am on the one hand, and I am the other answer undone. I am gathering your crackled crumbs of heart dust and wetting them with my own blood. I am the fixed zippers in your malfunctioning wrists. I am buttoning the lips of your suicide notes with kisses. I am the manifestation of never thought existed, the hidden message in the backwards vinyl of your death wish. I am the payoff for 11,011 days of alienation. I am the holding and I am the release. I am what will wrap around you and I am brave enough to make yes and my arrival is predestined no matter how as yet imperceptible and I am breathless with the building portent, and I am terrified, confounded, and blinded. Despite this, I will come. See the tumbling puzzle pieces falling at my feet, forming synergetic street? I am fate servant, following, faithful, fervent. I am for you, all your glass bottled messages come rolling up my shore, all your wishes drifting inexplicably to my star. This is me versus monolith, unable to avoid what is blatant. I can't not read the smoke signals billowing from your burning desire, can't not translate the morse encoded in your heartbeat, can't not finger the frail braille in your subtle body veins and wait. I will come like bass thumping up 111th Street, like thunder rumbling from 111 paces. I will come like pins and needles, a stomach full of butterflies, paroxysmal thighs, stifled cries, eyes rolling up and inside lids. I will come like vehement, agonizing beauty. I will come like pulse. Throb, wonderment, at the eleventh second, when you least expect it, when pathetic misdirection causes you to at long last abandon self-fulfilling prophecies, give up your taste for map making, throw down the accordion paper web of blue and red, and then when you are Empty-handed, I opened, readied, I will arrive, make no mistake. For like a chorus of a thousand hallelujahs, I will come.
Well, with, uh, with that, um, I would love to um, introduce Richard Grossman um, up to the stage to um, talk about the work that he's been doing over the last couple of years, and he's going to be a speaker at the Visionary uh, Convergence as well. So, welcome, Richard. What's that thing about you never have dogs or kids on the stage or never follow a poet? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with some sound, a little bit of music, just to bring us all into sync here and to center us. So I would suggest closing your eyes. So theoretically, just speaking theoretically, of course, if this was a sane world, we'd be out in nature, under the jungle skies or in a forest. We'd be sitting together about to partake of a sacrament, theoretically, of course. And we'd be listening to the sounds of nature. And then as the sacrament began to take effect, you might hear something like this. the word sacrament for ayahuasca, I am not using it metaphorically. I'm not using it because it sounds good. I'm not using it because we're supposed to turn psychedelic use into religion. I'm using it because of all things on this planet, ayahuasca, in my humble opinion, is one of the most sacred things there is. And why? You know, if you look on YouTube or if you, you know, go on Facebook, people talk about sometimes horrific visions. They talk about sitting around throwing up and how ayahuasca is punishing them and a lot of things that sound kind of scary. But that's not the true nature of a sacrament. A sacrament opens us up to divinity within. 
And so in ayahuasca world, very discreet, real place, the door of the heart, the door of the soul, the door of the spirit is opened. I, uh, I guess I should, I should ask, you know, who here has experienced ayahuasca? Everybody close your eyes so nobody sees you. <laughs> Theoretically, of course. Okay, almost everybody, so you all know a lot more than I do. Um, I, uh, for those of you who don't, uh, don't know, I, uh, means, it has a couple different meanings that are linked together. It means soul, it means spirit, it means death. Waska means vine, so it's called the vine of the spirit or the vine of the dead. So to me, the entry portal into the world of ayahuasca is when we allow ourselves the gift of dying. It's when we allow ourselves to let go, to totally release everything that we think we are, everything that we think happened to us in this life, everything that we think we know, and then to merge into that world that ayahuasca opens up. So I'm talking about Amazonian shamanism tonight. Something that I have a deep feeling for in many ways. Spent a lot of time in the Amazon. And I like to think, when I first, when I first went to the Amazon, somebody said, how did you get into this before we started? And I said, I'd talk about it. Um, my first visit to the Amazon was 12 or 13 years ago. And I ended up in the upper Rio Napo Valley where ayahuasca, the vine, supposedly, according to many people where the vine originated. <clears throat> I'm also just got back from Peru and I'm recovering from Peru, so got a little bit of a frog here. So it comes from where ayahuasca originated. And I was in the jungle and we drank this brew, which is realistically totally legal in Ecuador and Peru and Bolivia and a few other places, so I can talk about it. We drank, we drank the ayahuasca. I was with an old shamanic family. The head of the family, the, the father, I guess grandfather of the family, was an older man. I think he was in his 70s. And interesting story about him is that he was the custodian of a national park that was, for any of us, for an Olympic athlete, it would be a three or four day hike up and down, up and down, mud, rivers, crocodiles, lions and tigers and bears. You know, he and his wife in their upper 70s could do it in three or four hours. Nobody ever figured out how. But I was in the jungle and my first jungle experience of this medicine, which was not my first experience of it, but my first jungle experience was with this family. And as I'm feeling the jungle as the spirits of the jungle are walking up to me out of the jungle and greeting me and looking at me and checking me out and saying, oh, who are you? What are you doing here? You know, then I was like, oh, we like you. You're cool. You can stay, you know. But I felt like this realization, like this is a form of yoga that's happening in the jungle. What it's done impeccably. It's a form of yoga. It's a form of yoga means, of course, yoke, yoking our mind, yoking our consciousness, yoking our awareness to that which is within inside of us, to that perfection that's who we really are. So I'm in the jungle. The spirit of ayahuasca is so strong there. The sounds are so beautiful. And I recognized that I was in the presence of true magic. 
I was in the presence of pure, real magic. And that was amazing. That was so beautiful. And I felt at home. Not at home in the jungle, but at home here. You know, that started me on a, well, it didn't start me on the journey, but it was really a turning point in my work with these medicines. And it was a place, <laughs> I'll tell you a story. The third night, I was there with about five other gringos, and we were about to take a five-day trip on a boat down the Rio Napo to the Amazon to go to a conference that was happening in Iquitos. And after the second ceremony, one of the gringos told the shaman that, you know, well, gringos like the medicine a little bit stronger. <laughs> My deepest advice to all of you is never say that. <laughs> because the next night, oh boy. It was really, it was really funny. I, I don't share this too often, but it was really funny. Um, we were on the porch of the shaman's house, the curandero, the yapchak, they call them in that part of the world. And, uh, he pours, you know, a cup to everybody, and there's gringo, 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 his son, and then his wife, and then the shaman. And he pours it for me, and I'm like, I drank this, and it's like, I never tasted anything like this before. And I sit down, and his son drinks it, and he sits down next to me, and he sits down, and he goes, okay, fuerte. If you don't speak Spanish, it means, oh, how strong. <laughs> <laughs> and then his wife drinks it, and then he drinks it, and about 10 minutes later, every single person is leaning over the side, puking their guts out, except me and his son. And, you know, we were sitting there, literally, we talked about it the next day, and we were both thinking this, was that I'm not going to throw up until he throws up. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, uh, it was really funny. The shaman is over the wall, the first time in his life where he could not lead the ceremony. His wife is over the wall. His son and I are like, <laughs> so we didn't. We didn't. We didn't purge. I'll talk about purging in a minute, uh, but we didn't purge. And so this intensely strong medicine doesn't leave. So I'm sitting there like. 20% is thinking about how to keep it down. The rest of me is like, you know, WTF is going on. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the stuff you see, you know, if you ever watch that movie, um, Blueberry Renegade in America, you know, those visions are happening and things are moving and everything's happening. And then this immense energy, about a mile away in the forest, I could sense it, this immense energy just starts coming, coming, coming towards me. And I'm like, you know, I'm Jewish too, and it's like, what's a Jewish kid doing here? <laughs> Whoa. Um, you know, and, and ultimately, out of the jungle comes this 10, 12 foot high, female, beautiful figure comes up and stands in front of me and I'm like, you know, she was naked too. But I'm like, what is this, you know? And she looks at me and she says, you're mine now. And I said, cool. <laughs> And, 
and that was that was like the start of my real work with the medicine because you know how can something like that happen you know how can how can just drinking a combination of two plants open one up to something so unexpected I wasn't sitting there like, oh boy, I hope ayahuasca comes and says hi to me. You know, it was like, wow. You know, so unexpected. And that was the start of that ceremony. That was like in the first 15 minutes. It just went on from there. So beautiful. Yoga of the jungle. You know, really often, one of the things that when I'm talking to people about this, that are about to theoretically drink the medicine, you know, I, I always like, why, why do you want to do this? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of doing this work? Isn't that a good question? Yeah. I was, another ceremony I did in Peru, um, Two friends of mine and myself went uh, to Pucallpa, and this old, old, old shaman came out of the jungle for us. I'm not quite sure how it all worked out, but he came out of the jungle for us. And the two people I was with were very experienced. They were Europeans, and they'd been drinking for 20 years, and drank every couple of days in their home in Europe, and very, very experienced. And about halfway through the ceremony, the woman kind of crawls up to this beautiful old curandero, beautiful old healer, and just puts, puts her head on his lap and looks at him and says, Por que tomo? Why do I drink her? Why do I do this? You know? And I'm like, you know, wow, okay, I'm in awe of what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing. And he looks at her, I think it was a full moon, so I could see what was going on a little bit, or near full moon. He looked at her and with so much love, so much kindness, just says, para curar, solamente para curar, to heal, only to heal. So you have to you have to like look at this thing, this plant medicine thing that for us is relatively new. For most of us is relatively new. You know, my grandparents certainly <laughs> never drank ayahuasca. My parents certainly never drank ayahuasca. They heard about it from me, but they never drank it. You know, I could go back probably a hundred generations, and nobody had ever done plant medicine other than vodka, and, and, uh, the Jewish ayahuasca. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but, you know, so, why to drink this medicine? The jungle people entered the Amazon at some point in the past. Nobody really knows when the jungle is. You know, one, one of the one of the places. When I went to this place in Ecuador, the son who was sitting next to me liked books, and he showed me his library. And the majority of the library was full of termites and mold. <laughs> you know, things don't last there couldn't have a written language. So nothing to write on that would last more than a few weeks. No stones. Can't really make tablets. Not much there. Some pottery shards. Yeah, but some point way long ago, some genius of the jungle made a tea out of this vine. 
And you've got to look at how, how amazingly strange that is. Because, has, any, you know, has anybody been to the Amazon? You know, you know. You, you walk 10 feet and there's 2,000 plants. You know. I was told, I don't know that this is true, but I was told that in one hectare, which is 2.2 .2 acres, I think, or 2 point something acres of land in the Amazon, there's more species of trees than exist in North America. If you go 100 miles, another hectare, more species of trees that exist in North America, and they're different trees. And that's not even looking at all of the vines and the plants and the herbs and the mushrooms and the barks of the trees and the roots and everything else that's there. So how did somebody figure out, you take this vine, you smash it up, cook it for three days, drink it, and something happens. You know, and it, you know, anybody who's drunk it knows it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> you know, something happens. Because they were tuned in, that's not even talking about adding the chakruna or the chalipanga to it, just one plant. They were tuned in. They communicated with the plants in a way that we don't know how to do yet. Maybe we have a feel for it. Yeah. I took a class in herbology once and gathering plants in the Santa Monica Mountains, and you know, the teacher said, well, just feel the plants and choose the plant that's right for you. I was waiting for somebody to choose a castor bean. <laughs> you know, well, you're dead. You know. Because the doors of our perception, as Huxley said, are closed. You know, so why do we drink? Why this medicine? Why now? Is a really important question. I'm not going to answer it because it's a question every person needs to look within and find out. For me, it's not to trip. There's other things that are better. It might make you throw up. <laughs> For me, it's not out of curiosity. For me, it's a deep desire to heal. And what's healing? You know, when, I, when I practiced acupuncture, I practiced acupuncture for many, many, many years, and probably many, many too many after a while. When I practiced acupuncture, you know, the idea in Chinese medicine is that the superior doctor does not treat illness. The superior doctor prevents illness from happening. Isn't that an interesting idea? The superior doctor prevents illness from happening. You know, and so in preventing illness, healing becomes something different. You know, I could think, well, I have this, this, and this. You, know, you can have, what do they call them, the uh, CPT codes for them. Somebody's a doctor here. <laughs> you have the codes. This illness gets this number. This one gets that number. So if you have a CT CPT coded illness, you know, you could get to say, well, I have chronic fatigue. I have this, I have that. So that needs to be healed. What's amazing about ayahuasca, in my experience with it, is that it gives you the information and guidelines that you need to heal those types of illnesses. 
if they can be healed. I used to, um, when I first went down to the Amazon, I discovered clove cigarettes, which they had there. And I smoked a whole lot of them. They're yummy. And I smoked a whole lot of them. And one night I was in ceremony, and you know, I was like, da da da, this is nice ceremony. I'm seeing the clowns again, oh boy. You know, here's those patterns, nice. Uh, music of the jungle, and like, bam, I was like lying in a hospital bed, tubes down my throat, breathing me. Beep, 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 beep. And I was dead. And, you know, like this kind of voice came in, and I don't usually trust voices that come in ceremony, but this one I trusted. And it said, if you smoke one more of those cigarettes, this is your fate. You know, that was good advice. <laughs> yeah, that was good advice. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I stopped right there. Never smoked another one. That's that level of healing. You know, sometimes it'll be change your diet, sometimes it'll be exercise more, sometimes it'll be more dramatic things, change your relationship, change your work. Things we need to do, take this plant, take that plant. It's the job of the curanderos, is to see what plants you need. But there's other healing that's available. In Chinese medicine, in the Wang Ti, the Yellow Emperor's classic, there's a passage that says, in the Golden Age, what culture doesn't have a Golden Age? You know? In the Golden Age, is it metaphorical? Is it real? Good question. In the Golden Age, people never got sick because they were in perfect harmony. Note that word, harmony. It's important. In the Golden Age, people never got sick. But then they fell out of that state of harmony. And they had to meditate to get back into harmony. They fell out of that state. They had to do breathing exercises, pranayam, qigong, to go back into harmony. They fell out of that state. They had to exercise. They fell out of that state. They had to change their diet. They fell out of that state. They had to take herbs. They fell to the lowest state possible. They needed acupuncture. Where have we gone to? Surgery, drugs, lifetime patience. <coughs> so going back into healing, ayahuasca is up there in the plant kingdom teaching us how to, again, regain harmony. <coughs> Excuse me. How to, again, find our way back into that golden age. <coughs> Funny talking about healing when I have a cough. <laughs> So finding our way back into that involves learning how to be in harmony with oneself. That's why I drink the medicine. It also happens to be a lot of fun. But that's why I drink the medicine, is to become back into harmony with myself. So I'm going to avoid the, you know, <laughs> if you ever go, when you go to an ayahuasca conference, it's like, oh, there's a now inhibitor and there's the DMT. I'm not going to even talk about that stuff because everybody already knows that. 
and it's not that important. What's important is that the plant kingdom is communicating with us. Thank you. The plant kingdom is letting us know that we're out of balance, we're out of harmony, and letting us know that we don't have a long time left without regaining that harmony. So I started off saying, this is sacred medicine, this is a sacrament, and it is, because it connects us to that part of us, it can connect us to the part of us that's the knower. It can connect us to the part of us that is real within. And that's that highest level of healing. Musical interlude. This is a replica of a flute from the Nazca people, the people who made the Nazca lines in Peru. And if you look at it, it's broken by accident um, and then repaired. But the Nazca people, when they used these in ceremony, would use them once and then destroy them because it was considered too sacred to ever be played twice. And I can't really afford to do that, so I've had this for a while, but you'll get an idea. This is an ancestral flute, so if you close your eyes and just imagine, really, at the beginning of time, human time, there were cultures that had a poet, now I have a dog. Hi. <laughs> so, so the sound of this, it's a scale that's unique and up until recently um, had not been heard for thousands and thousands of years. So it sounds a little bit weird, but let it just take you. Let it just take you.
one of the magical things about ayahuasca is the technology of sound and the technology of song and the technology of the magic inherent in the vibration of song mixed with the medicine that is, I think it's unique in the medicine world. You know, the songs that are sung during ceremonies, depending on the cultures, are contain within them the power to transform and the power to heal. Another story. I was once in the jungle and I got a cold. And then I went to the mountains and forgot I wasn't in the jungle and fell asleep with no blankets on. And the temperature dropped down to about 28 degrees. <clears throat> and I woke up freezing, consequently had bronchitis, went back to the jungle and I'm sitting in a ceremony and I'm coughing my brains out. Gobs of goo are coming out of me. It was gross. Um, and, you know, having a medical background, I started to do what anybody with a medical background does in those kind of circumstances and assume the worst was going on. <laughs> oh my God, this is turning into asthma. I'm going to go into respiratory arrest here. And I'm like three hours from the nearest hospital and, you know, coughing, and that didn't help at all, thinking those thoughts. Um, a little bit into the ceremony, the, the curandero calls me up and sings me two songs. And I'm like, nice, I got two songs. That was cool. Most people only get one, you know. But he sang me two songs, and I went back and sat down at my place and took a few deep breaths, and relaxed and about, you know, it was kind of like one of those double takes of like, whoa, wait, wait, where's my cough? Where's my mucus? Where's my trouble breathing? It was all gone, totally gone. And the next day I was like, what did you do to me? You know, how did you do that? And the curandero just said, you know, I sang a couple songs to your lungs. <laughs> Pretty cool. So that's the technology of these songs. Of the songs are the, in one way, they're the map through the territory. A lot of people, you know, ayahuasca forms and stuff, well, I want to take the medicine alone. And whenever I see somebody say that, it's like, you know, where do I get it? I'll buy it on eBay. It's like, don't do that, you know. Because the songs are the ceremony, the music is the ceremony. And the music is the path to the healing. I personally love making sounds during ceremony, flutes especially. Because, you know, if, if, if we're, you know, if you're in the jungle as a gringo, and you're listening to these songs, they can sound pretty weird. Pretty amazing, but pretty weird. Because they're in a language we don't understand. And before I learned some of these languages, I thought it was very mysterious what was going on. This is really mysterious stuff. And then I started like translating some of them, and it's like, and I'm opening up you up to the healing power of ayahuasca. I'm opening you up to her world, to her magic, to her breath, to her light. Very simple stuff. When it's in a language like Shipibo, it sounds very different. You know, but these songs contain within the magic. And you know, I like music personally because 
it is a universal language. When I play these instruments, if you're feeling it, you're feeling something that transcends the verbal centers in the brain and allows for a different sort of magic to happen. So I have talked a lot already, and what I would like to really know is what you guys want to know. I have a question about the songs. Yeah. Um, I may or may not have had ayahuasca recently. Mm -hmm. We're just talking theoretically, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Europe, doesn't matter, but it was in a sense of dynamic kind of situation. So they played the music on the stereo, no, they weren't singing it. But the songs were like razor blades inside of me. I had, there was some songs I just thought I was going to be able to make it. You know, it, it just cuts so deep. I don't understand what that is. They weren't all razor blades, but some of them really were. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know the Santo Daime tradition. I'm pretty hardcore Upper Amazonian tradition. And, but I do know that, <clears throat> you know, some of the songs are designed in the Peruvian, I mean, you know, Peruvian Rio Napo tradition. They're designed to take away stuff in you that is no longer of service to you. Illnesses, disease, toxins, garbage, trauma, things like that. And it may be that that song was doing that for you, and that's why it hurt. You know, because sometimes, it, sometimes it's painful. You know, if, if um, What's the saying? How do you know that you're resisting something? Because it hurts. How do you know that you're resisting? It's painful. You know, so it may, it may have just been a bad song, too. I don't know. did it four weeks in a row, and it was the same, same song. Do you know what it meant? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes when I sing, people want me to stop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, that's probably what was happening. It's hard, hard to say. Um, <clears throat> personally, I would never go to a ceremony where music was being played that wasn't live music. You know, I, I, just, I just find the idea of turning on a stereo wrong, you know, just off. And some people would disagree with me, but... You know, I just find that there's something, you know, music is a relationship. And, you know, if I'm playing a song or singing a song in ceremony, I'm really tuning in to everything that's happening in the room, to every person's experience, to every nuance, you know, every sound that's going on, and paying attention to that and adjusting the music and the song to what's going on in the room. You know, to me, that's, it's art, you know, it's an art form. And um, stereo music doesn't do that so much for me. It used to, doesn't anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did that help? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess uh, regarding the sound, uh, this will go further that discussion. Uh, I've certainly been uh, having a lot of uh, novel experiences with um, several things in my life. Um, and I've done a couple of journeys uh, that were shamanistic. Um, and I don't think I've necessarily done ayahuasca, but I've done sasafras and things like that. I don't know if I'm saying it right. But um, 
with sound, one of the things that I personally realize is um, from a physics perspective, it's just um, vibrations of particles in the unison at different frequencies. And you know, sound, it's like a bell curve, right? And, and if two bell curves come together, it's a resonance. Right? And if that frequency gets to a certain level, you can actually break that thing that's emanating that sound. And the more I've, uh, and this is the first time I've actually done a formal uh, session where it's about sound. But this is something I've realized for the past several years, which is our heart, our mind, our body, and our spirit, they all have different frequencies of sound to them, which when reached through a certain device, I think experiences like those happen, where it can make or break, right? And I guess I, I was arriving at the question by uh, explaining all of this. Do we have, like, I know there's a lot of information out there, there's schools that teach us uh, about plant medicine and things like that, but um, do we have anything that uh, really digs deep into uh, the mechanics of uh, sound healing from a physics perspective. Not that everything has to be intellectualized, of course. But you can only conceptualize something after you experience it, but I'm just curious. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot that, um, you know, you can, you can find school. There's a school. There's actually going to be a sound healing conference up in Oakland in a few months or in a couple months. And people in those things really like that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, it's too complicated for me uh, to like look at look at it in physics. What I what I do feel though is, you know, there's the idea of entrainment, and I can play an instrument that will drive some of the people in here crazy, and some of the people will love it. Like maybe I will. Um, <laughs> You know, the idea of entrainment, which is when, you know, if, if I'm, somebody has a guitar over there and I have a guitar over here and they're perfectly tuned, if I pluck the G string, <laughs> the F string, the F string on the guitar over there will also vibrate. You know, it's entrainment. And sound allows our brains to become entrained to the frequency of the sound. You know, and I think what, what really, if you look at any of the ancient instruments, you know, they all have that as what's going on. Didgeridoos, for example. It entrains you, you get hypnotized by it. You get entranced by it. So, yeah, I mean, it's physics. The, the sound waves travel through the air, hit the eardrum, the eardrum vibrates, the three bones in the ear vibrate, which, you know, drives the fluid pressure in the cochlea to, to affect the cilia, which send the energy to our brain, the nervous energy to our brain. And so we hear the sound. But why certain sounds are magical <laughs> so th this is an instrument that's designed to entrain. And I'm only going to play this for a couple of minutes because some people might have a bad reaction to it.
<laughs> bit intense, eh? <laughs> Most of the sounds, well, a lot of the sounds you were hearing were not actually coming from the flute, they're coming from inside of your head. So, yeah. The buzz, yeah. So. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, right? <laughs> so, oh uh, yes. Um, something that came up um, in a number of talks when I was in Women's Visionary Congress in June were about now that uh, our Western culture is getting reintroduced to psychedelics and psychedelic medicine, um, how do we kind of um, make it our own in a way? Um, because I think there's, you know, there's a lot of schools of thought of, you know, do we do it exactly the way that they have done in these indigenous communities, or do we start to figure out our own ceremonies? That's a really good question. And the path that I've chosen to, to walk with this is to learn from the masters first, you know, to really dive deep into the indigenous ways because they have 20 or 30,000 years more doing it than we do. That's a long time. You know, lots and lots and lots and lots of wisdom there about how to work with these medicines. And you know, then I explore a little bit. Like That was totally exploratory. You know, there's nothing like that in the jungle. <laughs> You know, there's nothing like a didgeridoo in the jungle. I mean, there are now, but there weren't 20 years ago. You know, there's nothing like a gong in the jungle. I mean, there is now, but there weren't. So, you know, evolution is different from ego, which is like, oh, dude, you know, they're, they're doing it the jungle way. We want to do it our way. Let's figure out a new way to do it. I think there, there could be, I'm not saying there is, but there could be some danger in that. Because, you know, any, any of these ancient traditions, for me, deserve, deserve respect. They don't necessarily have to be followed implicitly. But they deserve respect because they know how to do it. If I'm going to play piano, I would have a much better chance of making something somebody else would listen to if I take some lessons. Or if I watch people who know how to play the piano play the piano. You know, maybe you know, an extraordinary genius savant musician could uh, never hear an instrument being played and then go and pick it up and make amazing music out of it that nobody's ever heard before. It's possible. But, you know, for me, with the, for the, in the ayahuasca world in particular, it's so huge. And there's so many places where things can go wrong. You know, and, and uh, I'm sure anybody who has gone to any theoretical ceremonies has been in ceremonies where things go wrong, badly wrong. You know, and how do you catch somebody who's getting possessed by a spirit if you don't know how to do that? So, you know, for me, it, it's really dealing with the respect of the traditions as the groundwork. You know, when I go to Peru and lead ceremonies, they're definitely not indigenous ceremonies, but they're rooted in the indigenous tradition. You know, they're rooted in understanding and respecting the medicine. So that's my feeling about that, is, um, you know, you don't want to go into, especially something as powerful as ayahuasca with hubris, you know. You don't want to go into it with hubris, you want to go into it with deep respect, and I would say even love, especially love. Oh, thank you.
Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your process for, uh, I guess, adapting music to different forms? I know, like in Peru, they, they diet the plant. And yeah. I guess the plant kind of teaches them. The plant teaches you, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I just, I, I know that you, you've adapted some of the um, traditional music to Yeah, like it start it started for me when I first went to the jungle and <clears throat> I took a couple of flutes and a couple of jaw harps with me and you know I was in a ceremony <laughs> a didgeridoo, a little portable didgeridoo, because I always traveled with that stuff. And <laughs> one of the ceremonies I was in, one of the first one was one of those ceremonies that was going really bad. <clears throat> the first few I did down there were really going bad. Um, Hey, there's a, <laughs> a room of 60 people, all, most of them on medicine for the first time. And like one guy was, <laughs> another one was, um, I am now channeling the 27th dimension of Zondor and you all must listen to me. And, you know, I kid you not. And you know, all this weird stuff was going on, and the poor Sean was up there, you know, I will come, you know, like, oh, what the fuck is going on? You know, and, and, you know, so I'm like, you know, I'm not a very patient person in some ways, and after about three hours of this, I just pulled out the dig and started playing it. You know, and actually went to the guy who was, I am now channeling the 20, put it in his face and put it in his face. <laughs> And you know, everybody quieted down. And everybody quieted down. And um, so I got, a, I got a bit of a reputation in, in that particular city. Um, not sure what, but got a reputation. And, uh, so I was invited into a ceremony with, uh, with another shaman, a really beautiful female shaman who passed a few years ago. And I was supposed to do some music because she wanted to hear what I was doing. And so she sang a few songs and then she said, play, you know, toka. You know. And I started playing and I'm kind of like horrified by what I'm doing. And, you know, what's going on here? I don't have the right to be playing music in a ceremony. And, you know, I finished and there was like total dead silence, which was intimidating. And about five minutes, she just is like, gracias maestro, toca mas maestro, play more. And she called me maestro, you know. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this works. The first flute I played is a jungle flute. So there is some tradition of music there. Um, I have another one that I got in Ecuador I could, I could play a few notes on. But then, you know, because I, I like to explore, I started playing with other things, because I have a whole collection of instruments. Um, that's a whole other story, how I got into that. But I have a whole other collection of instruments and, you know, discovered, I can't say I discovered it, but I found that um, most instruments are amazing in ceremony. When they're played, ceremony style, which I'm not quite sure how to define. But when they're played with respect for the medicine, what comes out is amazing. And, um, you know, people, people who, you know, really don't relate to the songs, relate to the sounds of the music. And, you know, I, I brought in a gong into ceremony a long time ago. And, you know, started playing it. And it was the most amazing thing you can imagine, what happened there. So it's, you know, for me it's an exploration. This one that I just played, brand new for me. When I first played it in a ceremony on this trip to Peru, I was like, well, this is scary, you know. I asked people how they liked it, everybody really liked it really powerful. 
So exploration, respectful exploration. You know, it's something, it's where I can get very um, kind of zen because does that really exist? No, does it really exist? Yes. You know. And are there actual spirits that come into a ceremony and attack people? Yeah, as far as I can tell. Are they beings from another dimension? I don't know. Are they constructs of the mind? I don't know. But they definitely have to be dealt with. So in a, in a well-led ceremony, the chance of that happening becomes very small. Because, you know, the, the analogy would be if, if, <clears throat> if you are magically transported to the middle of Calcutta. You don't speak the language. You don't have a map. You don't know where you are. You don't know who's a friend and who's going to rob you or who's going to kill you. You don't know any of this stuff. What do you want more than anything else other than to get out? You, know? you want a guide. And so, you know, the person who leads the ceremony, ideally, in an ideal world, knows the territory, knows that city so well that wherever a person might find themselves, they can help them into the light. They can help them into clarity. They can help them into the place where it's like, ah, I'm home. You know, but what we have up here is, by its very nature, crazy. You know, the mind is crazy. If you don't believe me, listen to yourself think for 10 minutes. <laughs> you, know, you add that to you know, medicine, you add the medicine to that, and you've got a crazy mind on steroids. Mm -hmm. Just like, and you don't know what's real. One of the biggest questions that I really like it when people ask it is, how do you know what's real and what's not in that world? You know, I, I asked a shaman that, a really well-respected old shaman, and he was like, and you know, he thought for about five minutes and said, nobody's ever asked me that before. That's the best question ever. Huh. You know, and he said, most of it's not real. Most of it's just what I would call brain farts. <laughs> you know. But here's the problem is that if you don't know it's not real, you can construct a nightmare out of it. And that's the danger. You know, I, I've, <laughs> one, one of the things I hate hearing, you know, it sends shivers up my spine and makes me feel slightly sick to my stomach and I hear it a lot in uh, places like Sedona or, you know, Cusco, not, not Cusco, uh, Sacred Valley, Pisac. It's like I'll hear somebody just say, the medicine told me too. And it's like, whoa, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was in one ceremony and you know, this cup, this male and female were in the room sitting next to each other. They didn't know each other's name. And by the end of the night, they decided that the medicine told them to get married. And they did the next night. Yeah. A week later, they got divorced, or two weeks later, they got divorced. <laughs> because, you know, it wasn't the medicine telling them that. How do you know the difference? How do you know the difference? Five minutes, you've had one. Louder, please. I would love to hear you talk about the process of like fully receiving the medicine and integration and really embodying the wisdom and what you recommend for that. 
Yeah. And what you personally I saw a cartoon mm -hmm. once recently on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the title of it was The Secret to Meditation. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of dogs sitting there. <laughs> and the secret to meditation was sit and stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so um, if you're in a ceremony, theoretically, if you're in a ceremony, sit and stay. You know, thoughts come, thoughts go. It's a very, to me, it's a very Zen thing. You know, I asked, I asked once a, a shaman in the jungle, uh, a Shipibo shaman, what do they do when there's no gringos around? Because, you know, if you've ever been to a Shipibo ceremony in the jungle, it's freaky. And, you know, a lot of the new, new people will be yelling and screaming and hollering and crying and emoting. And, you know, she said, we sit in the middle of the room, put our heads together and sing. And they weave magic with their songs. You know, no drama. No, the medicine told me this, the medicine told me that. No, you know, I saw the ETs and the grasshopper people and whatever else Terrence McKenna talked about, you know. None of that. It's just, we sit and we sing. We sit and stay. You know, so to go really deep, you have to go through all of the, what I would call, visionary state and get to a place where there's nothing going on except you, the music, and your breath. That to me is the highest point of ceremony. It's like when all of the just smooths out and it's just you there. No messages, no downloads, no God told me, no the medicine told me just you experiencing your own life. I don't know that it's possible to get deeper than that, other than the fact that you can go infinitely deep into that. Because who we are is infinite consciousness. Who we really are is infinite consciousness. You know, so that would be my advice, you know, in a nutshell with only two minutes left to go, on how to embody this is, you know, sit and stay, breathe, focus on the music, focus on the songs, focus on your breath. And, you know, if you look back in history to the ecstatic poets like Rumi, that's what he's talking about doing. Kabir, that's what he's talking about doing. Nothing else. And, you know, something about our, our movie and television and media and computer and video game jaded minds want drama. We want to be special. We want to be, oh yes, the medicine told me, you know. In, in, in Peru, they have a term called claridad, which means clarity, which is what they give people who drink the medicine and then think they're Jesus or some variation thereof. You know, that person's got clarity, you know, it's like, it means the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so sit and stay, dive deep, dive deep. There's no, there's no, one of the things, you know, one of my teachers said, our people had been drinking this medicine for 30,000 years, and we have no idea what its limitations are. <laughs> So how deep can a person go? There's no limitation. That's why it's sacred. That's why this is, you know, this is the true religion. This is the true rejoining of reuniting of soul and spirit and mind and heart and body. When it's done right. When it's done right. Any questions? I think we're up on time. We're there. Okay, can I play one more song just to...
when I was in Ecuador the first time, um, the son that was sitting next to me had a flute like this. And I was kind of looking at it like I wanted it. And you know, after a little while, I said, could you uh, tell me how I can get one of those? And he said, hang on. He walked into the jungle, came out 10 minutes later with a flute. <laughs> this is the flute.